Good morning. Time for our Bible study this week. Into the book of Exodus, uh, we go back into chapter 8. We're going to take a look at the next two plagues that the Lord sends to afflict Egypt. Um, the first two we're, we've made it through, the plague of water turning to blood, and then, of course, the plague of the frogs. And now we get to two more very physically unpleasant plagues, the plague of gnats and the plague of flies. So I'll start with the gnats first. It's uh, found in Exodus chapter 8, starting at verse 16. <clears throat> so let me read just the first couple of verses there, 16 and 17. We'll have a, a word of prayer together, and then we'll start into this. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth, so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth. And there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. Father, we pause. And as always, Lord, we just look to you. This occurred so many thousands of years ago, and yet it still has an impact today. And so, Lord, we ask you to help us, that your spirit would guide and direct our thoughts, our minds, that, Lord, our hearts would be open to hear from you, that your voice would speak through this study this morning, and that, Lord, in all of this, you would be glorified. Thank you, Father, for the time we have together, for this opportunity to look into your word. We ask you to use it to your glory now, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Pharaoh, once again, hardens his heart against Israel, and we saw that at the end of the plague of the frogs. Remember, at the end of that plague, Pharaoh was sort of indifferent, just kind of walked away from everything. And the Lord acts swiftly. There's no confrontation with this third plague, um, the, the gnats. There's no go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. There's no go to Pharaoh and tell him that this is going to happen unless it's just do this. He orders Moses to command Aaron to touch the earth with his staff and bring forth a swarm of gnats. And as he does so, this swarm arises right out of the dust of the earth. Now I know it says here that all the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. Uh, I think we're looking at a little bit of hyperbole there. Um, but suffice it to say that this swarm of insects was beyond anything that man had ever seen in nature before. And so let's not be overboard with, well, obviously all the dust in the earth didn't become gnats. Well, probably not, but the hyperbole here is just to simply remind us that this swarm of gnats was beyond anything that man had ever seen before. Now, and I know most versions of the Bible translate this as gnats. Um, the word in the Hebrew could also be translated as lice or any kind of biting insect. It could have been fleas. Um, it could have been any kind of insect like this. The, the word isn't specific to gnat, but it, it literally just means a swarm. And I know how irritating that can be uh, to, uh, to a small degree. Uh, years and years and years ago, my wife had moved into a house uh, we were renting it, of course. Uh, it was when I was in the Navy. And we were assured that the place had been cleaned before, since the last uh, renters had been in it. But I'm not so sure. Uh, we had just moved in. I was sitting with my on the floor, my back to the couch. Our cat was uh, there in the living room with us. And I felt something on my legs. And all of a sudden, our cat started scratching at herself like crazy. And as I looked down, I could literally see the fleas jumping out of the carpet. Oh, it was disgusting. Um, they were jumping onto my legs. And, you know, so I was brushing them off. And we were trying to get the cat out. And uh, it, was, it was terrible. Um, we had to do all the cleaning ourselves to get the fleas out of the carpet. So whether it was 
gnats or fleas or lice or whatever other kind of swarming little tiny irritant kind of insect it was. We don't know. What we do see is very clearly it afflicted both man and beast. There were gnats on men and beast, it says. Philo of Alexandria, who was writing in the first century after Christ, described the swarm as so thick and oppressive that the insects were crawling into people's noses and ears. Now, obviously, Philo may not have had direct contact with this because this happened thousands of years before he came on the scene. So we have no idea how accurate this was, but it seems to jive pretty closely with the biblical account. Um, the swarm would have been immense, beyond anything that, that man had seen in nature before. And if you've ever been in a swarm of true gnats, you know how irritating that can be. And they do. They fly into your eyes and your ears and your nose. If you open your mouth too long, they'll fly into your mouth. I mean, it's just, it's disgusting. And then we come to verses 19, 18 and 19 after this had happened. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So once again, the magicians try to replicate, they try to imitate what Moses and Aaron do, what Aaron accomplishes through the, the rod, the staff of God that he's holding. However, their secret arts fail them this time. This was beyond the limited power of even the demonic forces that they were serving. And the magicians confessed to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Now, before you think that the magicians have come to a, a, a saving faith in, in Yudhedvah, Yahweh, the God of Israel, understand that what they're really just saying is this is so supernatural, this is beyond our power. Um, there are other places in Egyptian uh, writings that talk about the finger of God. And, and what they're really saying was that it, it's as if one of their gods' finger has been placed on the scales. Uh, so it's not necessarily a declaration of faith in the one true living God, but rather it's simply the Egyptians admitting that they have exhausted their power. This is not something that they could duplicate. And again, this plague shows God's power and authority over the land itself. It shows that God's power clearly supersedes the false power of the Egyptian gods. And the magicians admit that. And there's a sense here, and, and this is probably where I like, you know, because in the past couple of ones, we were able to more so identify the specific Egyptian false deities that God was attacking. This one's a little more difficult. There are several different possibilities here. But here's the one that I really like that God is showing. Um, because in one essence, God is creating chaos out of order. Now, when God created all that he created, he was bringing order into nothingness. And so God created order. But now he's using his power, his divine authority, to bring chaos back out of that very order. And here's where it gets interesting. Because one of the big things that Pharaoh was supposedly responsible for was bringing order out of chaos. You see, if Pharaoh really was a divine, an incarnation of one of the deities of Egypt, if he was himself some form of divine being, they, they thought that Pharaoh himself could bring order out of chaos. But here, chaos is rising up out of order, and Pharaoh is powerless to do anything. So even though the magicians tell Pharaoh a very hard truth, this is not something that we can duplicate. This is, this is beyond our power. It's this direct attack against the divinity, if you will, the deity of Pharaoh. And rather than doing something positive about it, Pharaoh just chooses to ignore God. He just chooses to go on about his business, hardening his heart even more. <clears throat> and so we come to the fourth plague. Now, we're not told how long this third plague lasts. Um, but at some point, 
it passes away probably and you know the, the plague is over now here's again where we get into something a little interesting because for centuries scholars have tried to kind of isolate these plagues and either assign them strictly natural const you know uh, starts which I don't believe I believe these were these were supernatural um, God intervened and caused them to happen um, secondly uh, they'll try to group them together and sometimes they're grouped together in pairs and you know I had mentioned earlier that the first two seem to be focused on the river the next four focus on the land and the last four on the sky and that's certainly I think a valid way to kind of group them but here's another grouping that we need to see the first plague if you remember the plague of the water turning to blood God commanded Moses that he and Aaron should go and confront Pharaoh at the river and they did so. The second plague, even though we're not told that they were told to do so, they confront Pharaoh, it looks like, in front of his palace. Because when the frogs come up, Pharaoh just turns around and goes back into his palace. <clears throat> the third plague, the gnats, they don't confront him at all. God just says, make this happen, and they do it. Now we come to the fourth plague, and we're going to see that God once again tells them, go confront Pharaoh as he's going down to the river to bathe. So let's pick this up. Verse 20. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by the swarm of flies. We see this formula start to play out again. Remember, first plague, go down and meet him at the river. And now here we come to the fourth plague, go down and meet him at the river. Give him a warning. Tell him that this is going to happen tomorrow. And so here we see this same scene playing out. They go before Pharaoh and they tell him, let the people of Israel go. Because if you don't, God is going to send this swarm of flies upon you. And you saw how irritating it was for the, the gnats. And even if they were just gnats, if they weren't lice or fleas, it would have been tremendously annoying to have these swarms of gnats constantly around. But now God is saying, I'll send flies to you. And flies, as we know, are just a little bit more gross even, I think, than gnats. <clears throat> now, obviously, Pharaoh denies once again. And as a result, the Lord does exactly as he said he would do. He sends swarms of flies into the homes of the Egyptians. And let's face it, flies are ugly. They're repulsive creatures. But we have to be careful here. These may not have been house flies. There are more than one kind of fly. Some ancient writings indicate these flies may have been what are known as dog flies, similar to what we may call horse flies here in the, in the United States, biting, blood-sucking flies. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever been bitten by a horse fly. I have. Let me tell you, it hurts. Whatever they were, House flies, dog flies, horse flies, who knows? They afflicted all of Egypt. But this is the first plague where we are told that the land of Goshen, where the people of God, the people of Israel resided, was exempt. Can you imagine how that would have been? You know, I mean, obviously Goshen's the, the wrong side of the tracks, right? I mean, the Egyptians... I mean, Israelites are slaves. They lived in Goshen. That's slave land. But the slaves are not dealing with this problem, and you are. And, and 
You know, if you've ever been in a, in a room where just a single housefly has been flying around, you know how irritating that can be. And if you're in a room with half a dozen to a dozen of them flying around, it's like, oh my goodness, okay, I've got to do something. The wording of the Hebrew leaves little to the imagination. It says, great swarms of flies afflicted. The house of Pharaoh and the house of the Egyptians. Literally, it's like they became a weighty burden. Imagine having so many flies on you, around you, that it was as if a weight were cast upon you. And if these were the dreaded dog flies, blood-sucking, biting flies, I mean, little wonder Scripture says that the swarm ruined the land of Egypt. And he said it, they would be on you, they'll be in your houses, they'll be on the ground. I mean, it, it just, it's crazy to imagine this. It would have been horrific. As bad as the blood and the frogs and the gnats would have been, if these were biting flies, oh, oh, oh my goodness, this would have been terrible to try to live through. So it's little wonder that Pharaoh once again appears to relent. Verses 25 through 32. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said it would not be right to do so, for the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, they will... Will they not stone us? We must go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. So Pharaoh says, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Then Moses said, Behold, I am going out from you, and I will plead with the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. Not one remained, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. So while it appears that Pharaoh is once again ready to relent, mm, not so much. But he does call for Moses and he asks them to intercede and have the flies removed. He says, plead for me. First, he tells them, you can worship your God right there in, in your own land, right there in Goshen. Offer sacrifices so that these flies can be removed. And Moses and Aaron, Moses and Aaron they'll remain fixed and, and, and rightly so. And they said, no, they must travel into the wilderness because what they will be doing will be seen as an abomination by the Egyptians. So Pharaoh appears to relent. He says, fine, just plead for me. Just don't go too far away, okay? You see, Pharaoh still thinks that the Israelites are his people, that he owns them. Even though God has been telling him, and this is now the sixth time, really, that God has told him, let my people go. But Moses agrees, telling Pharaoh he will ask the Lord to remove the flies on the following day. And he's also bold enough to tell Pharaoh, but don't cheat again. Don't cheat on me again and not let the people of Israel go. But of course, Pharaoh has no real intention of letting the people of Israel go. He just wants the flies gone. And when all the flies are gone, once again, Pharaoh hardens his heart. You know, you'd think after a certain time, you'd learn. Right? Don't you? You'd think you would, but not so much. And sometimes I wonder, within all the patience of God, how long it takes for us to learn the lessons that he wants us to learn. You know, Pharaoh obviously was a stubborn, stiff-necked, hard-hearted individual. He was fully bought into the idea that he was himself a god, even though he was being shown to be powerless over these plagues 
And even though the very theology, the theological uh, framework that he lived within was being torn asunder by, by Almighty God, he refused to acknowledge. He refused to turn and repent. And how often do we see people make shipwreck of their own lives by doing the exact same thing? By refusing to acknowledge God, by refusing to repent, by refusing to choose the path that would bring them to salvation. So before we look too harshly at Pharaoh and write him off as just being idiotically stupid, let's be careful with that. Pharaoh was a smart man, possibly, but he was so lost, he couldn't even see that he was lost. And even when confronted by the very power of God, his own court magicians telling him, we can't duplicate these things any longer. Pharaoh refuses to give in. Now, my prayer for today is simply this. Don't be like Pharaoh. God has probably confronted you in numerous ways and, and in numerous times get you to turn to him. Don't be like Pharaoh. Don't harden your heart. Father, we give thanks. Lord, even as we study this, we see just how disastrous stubbornness can be on our part. When we choose to not hear your voice, when we choose to not see you at work, it's a disaster. And the same is true, obviously, for what Egypt was going through at this time. It was a disaster, all because of the hard heart of one man. How far the implications of our actions can reach, Lord, we don't even see. So, Father, be patient. Correct us, guide us, that we might honor and glorify you, the one true and living God, the Lord God. We give thanks to you today now and ask you to use this to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you next week.